Welcome back to Chemistry. My name is Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're taking a look at states of matter, and particularly how one state of matter or phase can transition into other phases. Now, we talked about those main states of matter in the last video. In this video, we're focusing on solids, liquids, and gases. Now, those three main states of matter that we're most familiar with are sometimes called phases. And when those states of matter or those phases change, from one into another, we call those phase changes. So for example, a solid changing into a liquid or a liquid changing into a gas. These are phase changes. And so we're going to focus on some of the names and some of the, the types of phase changes that can happen uh, in, in chemistry. So let's take a look at the first one that I have for you here. Now, in this little visual organizer, I have solid written on the bottom of my diagram, and that's mainly because solids have the least energy in their particles. Liquid is higher because it has higher energy or more energy, and gas is the highest because it has uh, most uh, energy in its particles. So if we change from a solid to a liquid, that phase change is called melting. Now that's a word that you've heard before most likely. How does this happen? Well, a solid has molecules that are you know, smushed very close to each other, and they don't have a whole lot of freedom of motion. They're basically just vibrating against each other. And as we add heat to that, as we keep adding energy to a solid, those particles start vibrating faster and faster and faster. And eventually, they have enough energy that they're actually able to break free from that, and they start being able to slip and slide around each other, and that's how that turns into a liquid. And so that's the process of melting solid changing into a liquid. Now, if we were to continue that process, a liquid changing into a gas, if you have a liquid and you keep adding heat, the molecules start moving faster and faster and faster, and eventually you add enough heat to those liquid molecules that some of those are actually able to literally jump out of the liquid phase and they jump out into the gas phase. And that process is called vaporization. Now, as I said that word, some of you may have been thinking of some other words because vaporization is not exactly a household name, shall we say. You might have been thinking of some other words like evaporation or boiling. Now, these are both very good words, but these are the two types of vaporization. Vaporization is more of a generic or general term for the change from a liquid to a gas. Now, do you understand the difference between boiling and evaporation? Hopefully you do at some level. Boiling is essentially rapid vaporization at the boiling point. And so if you've seen something boiling, perhaps water boiling on the stove, you know this is a very fast or a very rapid process. The molecules are churning around. You can actually see this. It's very quick. On the other hand, evaporation is a much slower process. This is vaporization that takes place below the boiling point. This is where high energy molecules at the surface of a liquid literally are jumping out to the gas phase. And so we have boiling and we have evaporation. Now let's think about some of the key differences between these. I think most of us at some level understand that, but let's take a look at some of the differences. In boiling, like we said earlier, it takes place only at the boiling point. So there's a specific temperature at which boiling is gonna take place. Also, boiling occurs throughout the volume of a liquid. You've probably seen this if you've ever boiled water in the laboratory or boiled water on a stove. The water is churning. There are these bubbles of vapor that are being formed throughout the volume of the liquid. And also, boiling is a very rapid process. On the other hand, evaporation takes place at temperatures below the boiling point. So water, for example, can evaporate at room temperature or temperatures even below that. Uh, evaporation occurs only at the surface and evaporation is a relatively slow process. I think most of us understand the difference between that. If you take uh, perhaps a pot of water and put that on the stove and turn the heat on there on the stove, you don't say, I'm going to evaporate some water. No, that would sound ridiculous. You say, I'm gonna boil some water. And likewise, if you accidentally take some water and spill it on the ground, and you walk away and then tomorrow you walk back there and, and the water's gone, you don't say, well, I think that water has uh, boiled off of the floor. No, that sounds ridiculous as well. You would say it evaporated. 
I think most of us understand the difference between boiling and evaporation. But these are the two types of vaporization. Now, we have a solid changing to a liquid. We have a liquid changing to a gas. Is it possible for a solid to change directly to a gas without becoming a liquid first? And the answer is absolutely yes. And the name of that process is called sublimation. Sublimation. So a good example of this is dry ice. That's solid carbon dioxide. If you ever had a chance to see dry ice, you see that it turns directly into a gas. It doesn't really turn into a liquid at all. It just sublimes. It undergoes this sublimation process. Under certain circumstances, water ice, H2O, solid can do the same thing. It can actually undergo sublimation in a freezer. If you take some ice trays, for example, and fill them with water and put them in the freezer, you'll have ice. But if you don't use that ice, you'll find that over time, those ice cubes start to shrink. They'll get smaller and smaller and smaller. And it's not because that ice is uh, melting and anything. It's actually turning into water vapor. It's undergoing the process of sublimation. So yeah, water ice can do that as well. Now, how about going in the other direction, losing some energy? Well, a gas changing to a liquid is called condensation. Now, you've seen this before. For example, anytime it rains, that's condensation taking place in the atmosphere. We have water vapor up there in the sky that's essentially turning into liquid and those droplets fall, and we call that rain. Now, how about a liquid changing to a solid? Well, that's called freezing. And so once again, we have certain types of precipitation that involve freezing, like freezing rain or hail. Those are good examples of freezing. Sleet is another good example of freezing. Now, if we can have a gas change to a liquid and a liquid change into a solid, do you think it's possible for a gas to change directly into a solid without becoming a liquid first? Well, once again, the answer is yes. And there's a name for that. And this is a name that is probably going to be new for you if you're uh, just taking this class for the first time. This is called deposition. Deposition. Now, some students struggle to think of examples of deposition. But if we think about things that happen in the weather, we can find some good examples of deposition. For example, the formation of frost. If you live in a place where it gets cold in the wintertime, uh, perhaps you've seen frost form on a car or on the roof of a house. Uh, some students have the misconception that frost is actually dew that freezes, and that's not what it is. It's actually water vapor from the atmosphere that literally crystallizes on the surface of things. It's called deposition. We call it frost. The formation of snow, that's also deposition, where we have uh, water vapor in the atmosphere that crystallizes, undergoes deposition, and then it falls to the surface. So snow and frost are really good examples of deposition. So as we think about the water cycle and our weather and our precipitation, we can think of examples of several of these different phase changes. So these are the six phase changes that you need to know about. Melting, vaporization, and know the two types of vaporization, evaporation and boiling. We have sublimation, and then we have condensation, freezing, and deposition. So there's a lot of vocabulary here as we talk about these phase changes. Now, let's put this together in something that's perhaps a bit more graphical, a phase diagram. Now, we can actually draw a phase diagram for any substance that we might want to, to talk about. And the way that we draw a phase diagram is we plot temperature on the x-axis and we plot pressure on the y-axis. And we basically can just plot the regions at which any substance, or the substance we're talking about, I should say, is going to be a solid, a liquid, or a vapor. And in this case, we have the phase diagram for water. And so let's think about just some typical temperatures that you're familiar with. Room temperature is about 20 degrees Celsius, so that's probably on our diagram somewhere around here, although this is not really drawn to scale. Normal room pressure is about one atmosphere, so that's right here. We just bring those together and we can see that at room conditions, water is certainly a liquid and that's what we would expect it to be. 
Now, what's going to happen if we take water at one atmosphere and 20 degrees Celsius and we start to heat it up? Well, if we want to see what happens there, we just have to go to the right along our x-axis here. So we move to the right along one atmosphere and we can see that we cross the border from liquid into vapor right at around 100 degrees Celsius right here. And what's it called when a substance changes from a liquid to a gas or a vapor? Well, that's called boiling, isn't it? Or vaporization, if you prefer. So water is going to undergo vaporization, boiling, right there at that point. So a phase diagram basically acts as a map that shows us the temperatures and pressures at which a substance will exist as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Now let's take a look at a substance that we might not be quite as familiar with, and that's carbon dioxide. So here I have the phase diagram for carbon dioxide, and let's imagine room temperature and pressure once again. So in the case of carbon dioxide, let's say we have this uh, substance at one atmosphere pressure, and 20 degrees Celsius once again. So one atmosphere pressure is right here on our y-axis. There's one. And room temperature is about 20 degrees Celsius, so probably somewhere around here in this area. So we can see that carbon dioxide is going to exist as a gas. And that makes sense, doesn't it? Now, what's going to happen if we cool it down? Well, let's go to the, the left on our uh, diagram here, and let's see what happens as we cool it down. So as we go to the left, and, and that temperature gets colder and colder and colder at one atmosphere, it transitions from gas into solid. So it crosses the border from gas into solid. What's the name for that? Well, gas to solid is called deposition, isn't it? So if we were to cool carbon dioxide gas, we would observe deposition. What about if we were to increase the pressure instead? Well, if we're at 20 degrees Celsius, and we jack up the, the pressure, basically, it's going to transition from gas to liquid. And what's gas to liquid called? Well, that's called condensation, isn't it? So you would actually see the condensation of carbon dioxide if you were to raise the pressure at room temperature. So if, this is very useful for seeing the temperatures and pressures at which a substance is going to exist. Now, let's point out a few key points on the phase diagram. I want you to notice that there is a point where the solid, liquid, and gas phases all converge. This is called the triple point. At the triple point, you can have a substance existing as a solid, a liquid, and a gas, all at the same time. And so the triple point for carbon dioxide, as you can see here, is negative 56.4 degrees Celsius and 5.11 atmospheres. Now that means if you could get carbon dioxide at precisely those conditions, and that's really tough to do, by the way, but if you could do that, you would see solid, liquid, and gas for carbon dioxide all at the same time. So it's like being in a spot where you have all these states that converge. There is a place, for example, in the United States called Four Corners, and it's a place where four states converge where you can be standing on this point and you're standing in Colorado, uh, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona all at the same time. You're standing in that one spot, but you're in four states at the same time. Well, this is kind of like what we have here. At the triple point, you have one set of conditions, but you can have three states. You're standing in three states at the same time. So that's the triple point. Now, we have another point up here. Notice where the liquid gas curve just kind of quits up here. This is called the critical point. And the critical point is basically the highest temperature and pressure at which a liquid can exist. And this is important in industry because very often if we're trying to transport gases, like for example natural gas, methane, one of the ways we do that is we liquefy natural gas. And we do that by basically raising the pressure. Notice that most of the time if we have a gas if we increase the pressure, it changes the gas to a liquid. And you can take that gas and you know, compact it down to a liquid. It makes it a lot easier to transport, perhaps by truck uh, or some other method, by a rail possibly. Well, if you have a gas or a substance and it's at a temperature above the critical point, you cannot liquefy the gas 
no matter how high you raise the temperature. And so the critical point is an important point on the phase diagram. So the critical point for carbon dioxide is 31.1 degrees Celsius and 73.0 atmosphere. So that's the critical point for carbon dioxide. Now, if you get a temperature and a pressure above that critical point, you have something called a supercritical fluid. And so it's not really completely a gas. It's very, very pressurized, but it's not a liquid either. So it's a supercritical fluid at those temperatures and pressures above the critical point. I hope you've learned something about phase changes and phase diagrams from this video. If you have, please hit that like button. I would really appreciate that. That really helps the channel. If you subscribe, it helps the channel even more. It helps get my videos out to other great chemistry students like yourself that want to learn about science. In the next video, we're going to continue our discussion of states of matter and talk about some of the properties of liquids and other states of matter as well. Join me in that video where we can learn some more chemistry together.